everyone, I'm Fred Franklin with Nebraska USA Wrestling State Chairman. I'm also here with Ron, H Ron Higdon with the NSAA. He's the Director of Wrestling. And uh, Ron, why don't you just kind of give us a rundown of like this year's state tournament. What's, is, is, is it going to be the same format as last year? Uh, how the awards are going to be given out? Just Is there anything different that's running different from last year? Well, to be honest with you, we, we always try to improve. We always try to get better. The format itself is going to be similar. Uh, the classes change a little bit between A and D and B and C. And the girls will always go in the afternoon on when it's in that format. So we're looking at um, basically the same type of format. The times are going to be very similar as they were last year. The awards are going to be similar. We do have some special awards that are going to be handed out on Friday night. Uh, some of our student achievements, some of our officials' achievements, and uh, worker appreciation stuff. Um, but we also have some, you know, news bells and whistles that uh, we're always trying to look for every year, trying to improve and make things more exciting and make it an event and try to make it special for people. Yeah, and uh, Ron, how long have you been the director of wrestling for NSA? Uh, 13 years. 13 years. And I remember when you took over, and I, I'll i say, you know, probably for all the other wrestling fans in, in, in the state of Nebraska, uh, you've done a fabulous job in turning this thing from what you know, we've always had a great state tournament, but you turned it into something way bigger than that. I mean, with the addition of obviously track wrestling about 13 years ago, for 12 years ago, whatever it was, um, there's a lot of things that you've added that's made it, um, you know, a fantastic event for everyone. Thank you. Um, the next thing I would like to have you talk about a little bit for us is what's the future of girls wrestling as far as uh, a state tournament situation. So we're, we're looking at um, obviously changing the format because we can't add more participants to the current format and, and number one, get it done in the time frame. Number two, get the, with the popularity and the growth of the fans, we can't get all of them in the facility with all classes together. So we are going to have to make a format change. And I, I want to be clear that, that my job is to make sure that it's the best for everything, considering all the situations and all the tentacles out there but I have no desire to take away what we have built and the excitement that we have with our our tournament specifically Friday night uh, semifinals when that's the first time that all classes come together uh, I, I want to do whatever I can to try to keep that um, that being said uh, I've mentioned before that we don't own these facilities uh, we negotiate with them they have uh, multi-year contracts that are signed uh, pr from previous years. So just changing something from a couple of months out to something different is next to impossible. Uh, it, it actually, for us, contractually is impossible. So we are looking and we're in conversations with CHI and looking at our options and looking whether we make it a five-day tournament, uh, some sort of format. The difficulty with you know multi-days and adding days with that are your weigh-ins also. Uh, that and the fact that uh, trying to pull kids out of school all week long. So we have to look at everything. And, and I'll be honest with you, um, I'm open for, and, and believe me, I get plenty of suggestions. But I'm open to them and I read them and, and we, I don't make these decisions on my own. I mean, I, I have, uh, com we have committees that we talk, that we develop and we talk about and we work on scenarios and work on situations. We talk with different venues, uh, what our possibilities are. Um, but uh, I want to make it abundantly clear that we have no desire to take away what's going on with the, the atmosphere of our state championship in wrestling. Okay. Um, I had heard that there was some kind of proposal that's going around that, that is a, that's going to be an option on the table for next year. Can you tell us a little bit about that proposal? Sure. There's a legislative proposal through the schools that they start in October. They, do, they submit proposals. They vote on them in November. They vote on them in January. And if they get enough support, they do the final vote in August. No, April. So at the April meeting, my guess is, because it has passed all the other voting unanimously almost, that we'll have another class of girls wrestling, which is is finally warranted you know before this year it was probably not um so having two classes of girls and adding another class is going to require us to do something with the format and when we talk about making a change for the future um, we have to look at when do you qualify um, how many 
how many referees do we have during those time frames? Can we do all of those competitions at the same time? For example, we did our district final, girls' district finals all on Fridays, and we gave them to sites that could do a Friday and a Saturday boys' district. So they have a girls' district final on Friday and a boys' district uh, tournament on Saturday. And we did that because we have to share officials. Those officials that are doing the girls' district final are going to stay at that venue and do the boys' tournament because we don't have the quality of officials to to send out to districts. We actually don't have enough that even apply mm -hmm. to cover all of the need. So officials is a big one that we really have to tackle, and we have to be cognizant of how we treat them um, because we're recruiting. We have 60 first-year officials this year. Now we have to keep them, so we have to train and retain. And along with that, there's going to be some bumps and bruises and some bad calls, and we're just going to have to, as a community, come together and support them and help them through this early times and develop a pool of officials that we can use for the future. So this new proposal that's probably going to pass, it was basically to go to a two-class system for girls, but has there's nothing that's addressed as to what a 2025 girls state tournament could look like. Correct. So that we have the ability as a, as a staff in our office, uh, and like I said, we get input from outside entities uh, of what the format is going to be. We ask at times uh, what uh, the opinion of our schools, but that typically doesn't come as a way of proposal. Sometimes it does, but most of the time it doesn't come in the way of a proposal. We sometimes have to make adjustments before that proposal process can happen because that process is so long. We have to make a change before the, the proposal. Like all the proposals that are in the system for this year will get implemented next year. So there's not a proposal for a, a format change at the state tournament in this last set of proposals. So we're going to have to make a change before the proposal system. So we have the ability to do that out of our staff and our office. And so that's what we're looking at for the future. Okay. So what does Ron want to see? I want to see the continued growth of wrestling, the popularity of it, the following. And I commend our schools because we have several schools that have huge followings. And that's just good for our sport. You know, we have created some excitement, not only at our state championship, I think that's the culmination, but with the high level duels and, and the way that people are treating and the following that we have, that I want that to continue to grow. That's my, that's, it's been a part of my life, my entire professional career has been around wrestling. Um, I was a coach, you know, for several years and now I'm fortunate enough to do something that I love and I have a passion for. So my goal is to continue to create experiences for these kids at the championship level and make it something they'll talk about for the rest of their life. That's our goal at all of our championships. And I think that we accomplished that in a lot of them because other than the big show for Division Ones, they'll never compete and wrestle in front of people, this many people and this kind of cheering crowd in their life. So for 2025, obviously the girls are probably going to be a two-class system how do you see the scheduling for the state tournament of 2025? I think that's still up in the air because we, we have to wait to see what availability we have with facilities. We're currently in those talks. We're talking to multiple facilities. Uh, we're talking about multiple options. And, and I'll be honest with you, I personally would love to be able to keep the boys in a three-day tournament and keep it the old format that we have because... It wasn't broken. It, it was it was fantastic. The addition of the girls has added excitement. It has added, I think it probably has exceeded everybody's expectations. Mm -hmm. And um, not that we want to take the girls out of that, but we almost have to. And the girls, in some way or shape or form, are going to be involved in a championship. And it might be at the same time as the boys in some form or fashion, or it might be on their own. It might be in that facility. It might be in another facility. But that's all up for discussion. And mm -hmm. we have to de decide how we're going to move forward. Okay. So my last topic of, of questioning is called big ticket questions. Sure. <laughs> so um, kind of give us, an, I mean, we've all been reading on the internet. We kind of got a good feel an idea of what all happened. Obviously, CHI allots NSAA a certain amount of tickets that are then distributed to all the schools. The schools, I mean, obviously before that, the schools send in what they would like to have. And mm -hmm. then, and, and you know how many tickets you're going to get from 
CHI. Um, I guess one of the questions would be, did you get the same amount of tickets from CHI this year as you got last year? Yes. Yes. Okay. So the, the big shortage has come because there's been so much more uh, demand for tickets than in previous years. Correct. Okay. Um, the, uh, so can I take us through uh, the ticket situation? Well, I want to start with the ticket request form, ticket order form, whatever you want to call it. <clears throat> we do that so that we can take care of our schools and allow them to order tickets to number one, sit as a community because they're, it's all reserved seats. Mm -hmm. So the ticket office at CHI handles all of it. Um, they take those ticket request forms, um, they divvy up and try to place people as communities in sections. And sometimes that's so, the order is so, you know, the requests are so large that they'll have a, a section here and a section over here of the same community because they can't put them all together. Mm -hmm. um, but that being said, this is the first year that we've had this kind of demand for the requests, right? So even that, we didn't anticipate as much. And I, people say that we should have, and, and maybe we should have, but we didn't, we still feel like, I still feel like we're gonna get, and I can't guarantee it, so I don't wanna say all, but I, my hope is that we get everybody in the facility that wants to be in there. Mm -hmm. And that's really, we're talking about session five, because session six, we add so many seats to the, when we go down to four mats, we bring in 2,000 seats, we're able to sit that many more people that we don't sell those tickets in advance for. Those have always been sold the day of. So with that being said, there's gonna be availability to buy tickets. Um, what has created, what's been created over the last couple of years, with all of those session five and session six tickets not going on sale online, those third party vendors haven't been able to get their hands on as many tickets. Before, when we opened up the public, they would gobble up everything that was left and try to sell them at a ridiculous price. A $10 mm -hmm. ticket is all we sell, is a $10 ticket. That's all CHI sells, that's all the NSA wants the CHI to sell it for. If somebody's asking more than that, they're not from CHI and they don't represent NSA. So we ask that, number one, people that have these tickets in their hand, don't sell them to those people. Don't sell them to the scalpers. Don't sell them to a third-party vendor that's going to put it up on a website. If you can, let's take care of the wrestling community. Let's talk about, you know, hey, I'm not going to go. Do you need tickets? Or I need tickets. Who's not going? And we provided a, a forum on our AD login that's going to allow them to communicate with that. And hopefully those tickets that are not going to be used, and we have it every year, mm -hmm. those tickets that are not going to be used are passed along to people that need them at a, at a reasonable price. We don't have control over that. When people purchase a ticket, they own the ticket. They can do with what they want. Um, but that's one of the things that is really frustrating for us is when those third-party vendors get involved and then people think that we are trying to sell those tickets for a crazy price. So uh, the, the forms from the member schools that were ordering all these tickets, they had to be into you by, I believe, December 6th. That was, the, that was the first deadline okay. to, to get put in the first drawings. Mm -hmm. uh, we took order forms, and we didn't take any other order forms after January 3rd. Okay, so I didn't realize there was another second deadline. So during that whole time, so they get placed in line as they get them to, to, to be in the drawing and try to get, they all want better seats, so mm -hmm. we try to do that. That coupled with we see where they, play, they were placed in the past, specifically the year before, and if we can, if they were in the upper bowl, nosebleed, we try to get them lower. Mm -hmm. You know, We, meaning the CHI ticket office. Our office is not involved in any of those allocations. Mm -hmm. We ask them to put these parameters in place, and we double check, and, and sometimes, every once in a while, it'll be like, well, we've been in, we've been in the upper bowl for the last two or three years. And if I, if I hear that, we have record of where they've been. And sometimes they say that and it's not true. <laughs> and sometimes they say it and it is true and we address it with CHI and we put them at the first of the list and let them you know, be placed accordingly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So because you had a second deadline, it was early January, then really there hasn't been that much time that's transpired between that deadline and you've been able to you know, sort out all the tickets and get everything sent out. And then obviously during 
sometime after that January 3rd is when you probably really started realizing that we have a big issue. Yeah, so once we got the numbers, number one, we didn't want the panic to start right away. We wanted to try to figure out a system to allocate. Um, and then we worked with them. They work, the, the, the people in their ticket office, they do larger events than this. Uh, they do swim trials, they do college world series. Like they handle all of this all the time. That's their daily job. So we went to them and, and came up with scenarios. Uh, they gave us their opinion and this is what we settled on for the allocation, the, the system that we did. So that being said, um, we knew there was going to be some backlash. We, it takes about three weeks to allocate and try to place everybody. Mm -hmm. That's why we don't wait until after districts to do it. We have to do it before that. Otherwise, we can't get it done in time. Also, we could just, and, and you know, as, as much grief as we've gotten, we've talked about, all right, we're just gonna open it up like we do all of our other championships. And people will say, all right, on January 2nd, we're gonna open it up to the public mm -hmm. and everybody fend for themselves and they can, you know, sit wherever their seats are uh, for the seats that they buy. Um, but I don't think that that's the right way to do it. I don't think that that takes care of our schools. I don't think that that's the best way for our schools and communities to be together and enjoy the experience that they've had for the last several years. So, but we have those conversations because to be quite honest with you, um, we know that we're not gonna please everybody, but there's, there's some people that are, I don't know that we'll ever please them. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. So I did a lot of reading and from comments and stuff from schools that were posting on social media, and it seems like there's you know some schools are saying that they got fifty percent of their tickets. Some schools are saying that they were only short twenty five percent. Some schools are saying they got almost all their tickets. And I guess one of the big questions out there that seems confusing to the wrestling fans is that. You know, what kind of formula was used to start divvying out these tickets to these schools? So we have the history of classes and what the classes have ordered. And if you look at it, every time you go up in a class, there's more schools. Mm -hmm. So the more schools means more communities. The more communities means more tickets are sold. So actually, Class A, even though they're the largest school, they have the lowest number of schools, and they have the lowest ticket. I mean, the, we've tickets purchases yep. in the past yeah. so we, we went to that and we looked at what their average was and we gave them a, a limit like so class a has a limit mm -hmm. uh, then we take that limit and we divide the number of schools and then that gives us um so the total limit mm -hmm. so say, say that's two thousand yeah. so that total limit of two thousand for class a all session tickets um divided by 33 schools then that gives you the limit then we fill those all the way to we can and then if there's any Body that has ordered less than the limit, we take that back out and put it back in the pool and reallocate it to the Class A schools. Mm -hmm. That's why everything's different. So you have Class A boys and Class A girls, depending on which one they ordered, mm -hmm. because both of them have a limit. Yeah. That's why it's it's confusing, and it's not something that you can just put down in an email um, or a social media post, because it's a lot. There's so many tentacles that go to it that it's difficult to explain. But when we have the chance to talk and we talk to people, Although some of them don't agree or don't don't like it, most of the people say, "Okay, at least I understand." Mm -hmm. And so that's what we want: is people just to understand that we're not trying to, um, you know, make it worse for any class or any specific school. But we felt like there, if there's a limit and somebody ordered less than that limit, cutting a percentage was not fair. We didn't feel like that was fair. Um, some schools, actually, there's some schools that um, didn't get the ticket order form in time. Mm -hmm. And so, the, and we didn't accommodate them because they missed the deadline. Mm -hmm. So there's some of them that are gonna have to buy their tickets online for sessions one through four or at the window, and then stand in line to buy a ticket for session five and six. But that's the way it is. Yeah. So let me just get this straight, make sure that the viewers all understand. So, and tell me if, I'm, if I picked this up wrong, but uh, let's say class B. So you took the number of tickets that was an average of what normally class B would order, and then you allocated a certain um, amount of tickets from CHI to those class B, and you took, let's say, let's say there's 32 teams. You took those 32 and you gave each one of those 32 teams the same number of tickets, and then depending on their fan base, some of their fan base might have been a little smaller than others, they would have shown that maybe they got almost all their tickets, and then a fan base, let's say like Omaha Scott, 
might have had um, a bigger fan base, but they got the same amount of tickets as another Class B school. Correct. Okay. So that's correct. So that now that that really does explain uh, why there seemed to be a little bit of a percentage proportional uh, situation going on there. Right. Um, so what do you suggest? Uh, it's obviously mainly for session five and six is what we're talking about. Uh, there should be no problems for sessions one through four. None. Okay. So sessions five and six, what do you suggest people do, the people that did not get their tickets, what, what would you like to tell them and suggest that they do? I would say first, um, once districts are, are complete and if they, they have a neighboring school, uh, reach out and say, are there any tickets that you're not going to use? Instead of giving them to you know some sort of company to resell, um, maybe they maybe they can buy a session five tickets, session six tickets from them, uh, or do a ticket exchange. I know there's a couple of people that are trying to help on social media mm -hmm. to give them a platform to communicate, um, and and are doing the best they can to keep the, you know, unsavory people out of the, those groups. Right. Um, but that's that's one one of the things that I think can alleviate some of it because we always have people that purchase tickets that don't come. Mm -hmm. We always have it. Right. Um, but that being said, we will have some tickets available for session five. CHI policy is they do not sell standing room only tickets, which is what they're called when they don't have a seat assigned to it. Standing room, they don't sell those until the day of the event at the time of the session. So they're not going to, they're not going to pre-sell those in advance. That's their policy. Mm -hmm. Um, so they're, we already have a system signed up, and they do it with Creighton Basketball. They do it with other larger events that people that already have tickets go in this line. People that are wanting to get tickets go in this line. Everything, they're not going to be standing outside. They're mm -hmm. going to go in through the, you know, mm -hmm. the, whatever. The, the, the big hallway. The hall, yeah, you know, the grand hall. Yeah. And so they can come in and uh, stand in line and, and per start purchasing tickets when that session starts. Now we're out opening the doors early so people can get in there. At the end, like when we get towards the end, we can see what the scan count is because we scan every ticket. And for example, last year we had 12,400 seats and we only scanned 10,000, mm -hmm. just over 10,000. We still had 2,000 seats that we could, tickets that we could sell uh, for those seats. Will CHI have um, uh, actual seat tickets available? Uh, do they have that available, you know, anytime soon? On on session uh, sessions one through four, yes, they're yes. going to go on sale online. Okay, so that and they can people can buy that straight through CHI. CHI. Through the through the yes, and they'll and be ten bucks. The, and, correct, and okay. we have that link on our website. Okay, that will be open on Monday. Okay, so my last question um, on that would be: let Let's say somebody comes in, and uh, and they decide I'm coming the day of the event, and I want to. I'm going to get a standing room only ticket. Um, that would probably be me because I, I I can never be in one place. I'm I'm always going around from mat to mat. But so they get they get a standing room only ticket. Tell me, where do they stand? So on the north and south ends, that's the, the one's called the bud zone down mm -hmm. at that that uh, north end, mm -hmm. and then the other on the south end. And and there's no seats right there. There's mm -hmm. just railings. And so right there, some of them, but. We, there's also seats, empty seats, yes. and that's why they call it standing room only because they can't sell a ticket that has that seat on mm -hmm. it because it's out there. Yeah. Right. So if we if we got the the ball rolling and there's still you know two thousand seats to be sold, they have a full staff of ticket people selling tickets and then they can right. get in within just a couple of minutes. Yeah. I'll say that I've never had a problem finding some empty seat. You know, sitting down at, at a mat watching a match. And then getting up and, and going someplace else. I think the panic is that people are afraid that they're not going to get in. And we have yet, since we've been at CHI, we have yet to have to turn anybody away. I'm not saying that it won't ever get there or that we won't be there this year. But I think that number is going to be very low if we have to turn anybody away. And we're going to do whatever we can to try to get them in the facility. Mm -hmm. And so we have to have some faith, number one, and patience and, and hopefully not panic mode mm -hmm. so part of that standing room only you know for me uh you know I th once you come up to that first level where you have that platform that you know it's really long and then you have the retaining wall right after that you know there's a lot of people like to stand with their back up against that retaining wall 
Uh, sometimes the security allows you to do that. I mean, they don't like it when you're standing at the rail, right. but you're standing at the retaining wall. Is, are they going to be a little lenient with that? We're can, gonna you, have, can you talk to them about that? We can, and we're also, we also talk to them about, all right, um, when they're uh, sticklers about, you know, hey, do you have a ticket for this session? You know, for this section. Mm -hmm. So um, we're trying to work with them. They do have some policies that they have in place, and we want to also protect the people that have actually bought those tickets. Mm -hmm. So that's why those ushers are there. But to answer your question, those people are in place to, to for so that people don't stand along the rail and people are trying to see they're standing in the way. Mm -hmm. So they're trying to keep them away from the rail. But yes, we have those conversations. We already have. Mm -hmm. And so we'll continue to do that with their staff and hopefully um, massage it to where, where it's going to be not, not uncomfortable for, for anybody, mm -hmm. but at the same time, people have to work with us and they have to be willing to uh, accept change, uh, go with the flow, be adaptable, mm -hmm. and, and yeah. have faith. Yeah. Well, that's really all I had, uh, Ron. I appreciate you taking the time today to talk to us. And uh, we kind of go back a long ways. I yeah. have a lot of respect for what you do. Thank you. And, uh, you know, dealing with, um, you know, big, big tournaments, I, I think. I can relate to that and, and uh, so I know what you go through and um, so uh, if anybody has any questions you know Ron is always available you can shoot him an email uh, you know he checks his email and all and obviously if anyone has any questions about Nebraska USA you can either contact myself or your or our executive director Matt Pace all of our contact information is right on the website and we will see you at the state tournament.